Hello everyone, my name is Don. I'm an audiologist and also a PhD student at McGill. Today I'd like to talk to you about my project where I will have the chance to combine hearing sciences with neurosciences to try and understand how we listen with the brain. First, I'd like everyone to close their eyes and try to imagine a world without sounds. It's pretty difficult, right? Our sense of hearing is always on. It is so present in our lives that we often take it for granted. We wake up to the sound of an alarm. We listen to music during the day. But most importantly, we use our sense of hearing to communicate and connect with each other. Individuals with hearing loss often feel excluded from this hearing world. Imagine a night out with your friends. At the beginning of the evening, you guys are chatting, having a good time. You're missing a few words here and there, but it's not so bad, you can fill in the gaps. As the night progresses, you're a bit more tired and you're missing a bit more of the conversation. By the end of the evening, you don't really understand what is being said anymore and you really feel removed from your group of friends. It's not surprising to me that hearing loss is more and more associated with increased depression, increased social withdrawal, and even increased risk of dementia. So how can we help people with hearing loss? The most simple solution is the hearing aid. This device is a small microphone that fits in or around the ear, that listens to the environment, and plays back the sounds that it hears to the person wearing the device. Every hearing aid is personalized to the person wearing it, where the volume is turned up for the specific sounds that that person can't hear. Now this solution works for most people. However, individuals with a more severe form of hearing loss or that are completely deaf do not benefit from hearing aids. Their hearing is, or their ears are far too damaged, and it doesn't matter how loud you turn the volume up, the sounds remain unclear. To make a parallel with how we see, picture reading a text on a computer screen. If the letters are too small, you can always zoom in and make them bigger. However, if the letters are blurry to begin with, it doesn't matter how big you make the letters, it's still difficult to read. For people who cannot benefit from the hearing aid, a cochlear implant might be suggested for them. Now this device, the cochlear implant, is truly impressive. Simply put, it is able to restore hearing in completely deaf individuals. In some aspects, it functions similarly to the hearing aid. There's a small microphone that fits around the ear that listens to the environment. However, there is no sound produced from this device at all. Instead, what is heard by the microphone is transformed into an electrical signal that is delivered directly to the brain, bypassing the damaged ear. To come back to our parallel with how we see, instead of zooming in or making the letters bigger on the computer screen, with the cochlear implant, what we're doing here is we're rewriting the blurry text. Now this device has helped more than half a million people around the world. It has produced amazing results. Children that are born deaf can now be implanted by the age of six months. When they grow up, they will develop functional hearing and normal spoken language. In fact, when you talk to these individuals, you wouldn't even be able to tell that at birth, that person couldn't even hear a fire alarm. Sadly, not everyone who gets implanted share these amazing results. Some patients, despite going through months of rehabilitation, still struggle with understanding sentences or words in relatively simple situations. So why is there such a large range of results with this device? Well, we know that it is a combination of factors that influence how well a person will receive this cochlear implant. These factors vary from at what age did they get implanted, uh, what is the cause of their hearing loss, for how long have they been living with hearing loss, and many, many more. Despite our best knowledge, we're still not able to fully explain or accurately predict why some individuals perform poorly with the cochlear implant. Now this is where I come in with my project. I'm interested in another piece of the puzzle. So hearing is not only about the ears, it also involves the brain. There's this saying in neuroscience, use it or lose it. In regards to hearing loss, the information coming from the ears is not as useful as it once was, or simply not available anymore. In response to this, our brain changes. It adapts to this new reality. It slowly loses its ability to understand sounds. Instead, it will favor processing information that is more relevant to it, 
or available to it. For example, deaf individuals are exceptionally good at uh, lip reading and they are also very good at decoding facial expressions and body language. It is not, um, you have to admit that this adaptation from our brain is quite remarkable and you can only applaud how intelligent the brain is for uh, being so adaptive in these new situations. Uh, currently, we, cannot, we do not have any methods to evaluate how flexible the brain is or how ready the brain is to receive the cochlear implant or how well it has adapted to this new device. It is not because of lack of trying. There is one major obstacle in evaluating the brain with cochlear implant patients, and that is the device itself. The electronic components that are implanted in the patient prevent us from using traditional imaging techniques. For my project, I will be using a relatively new imaging technique that is fully compatible with the cochlear implant. This technique is called NEARS. So NEARS uses light to image the brain. It functions similarly to a pulse oximeter. Those are the alligator clamps that you find in the hospital that gives you a reading of uh, blood oxygen saturation. Instead of only having one detector clamped on your finger though, we fit a cap with many detectors all around the head. This allows us to detect changes in oxygen in specific regions of the brain. The theory is when you use certain regions of the brain, for example, regions involved in hearing, you have to fuel those regions. And in the brain, fuel comes under the form of oxygen. So by tracking changes in oxygen, we're able to to, to track changes in brain activity. Using this method, I will follow changes in brain activity throughout the patient's rehabilitation journey. My goal is to identify patterns of activity that are associated with good results, but also patterns of activity that are associated with poorer results. In doing so, we will have more tools to identify patients who need a bit more help earlier on during the rehabilitation. Also, by understanding how brain activity changes through time and throughout rehabilitation, we will have uh, more hints as to how to personalize or fine tune our rehabilitation strategies, even potentially developing personalized treatments for each individual patient. Finally, since we're already evaluating the brain, this opens up new opportunities to develop rehabilitation methods that directly target the brain. And I'm thinking of brain stimulation here. I know, when I say brain stimulation, it might sound scary, like zapping someone in the brain or electroshocks. But I assure you, our new and modern techniques for brain stimulation are more similar to brain cheerleaders, where we encourage certain regions of the brain to, to work a bit harder and to push, push, push. To summarize, with my project, I will look beyond the ears to understand how we relearn to hear with the use of the cochlear implant. Ultimately though, I hope that with my research, I will be able to extend the life-changing benefits of the cochlear implant to a maximum number of patients. Thank you for listening. <laughs>